Very exciting partnership to announce here with James Lee of 5149. He's somebody that Crystal and I have followed on YouTube for a long time, and he's going to be doing some videos for us here. James, it is great to see you and introduce you to the audience. Thanks for joining us, man. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? You and I talked a little bit about this previously before you decided to come on. Who are you? Why have you decided to make all these awesome videos on YouTube? Uh, no, that's a great question, uh, Sagar. I think, well, I, I see myself kind of as a, I would say, a citizen journalist. Uh, my background is in business. I still have a day job, but I think it's really important that we all play a role, an active role in understanding the actors and levers that uh, move our society to hold them accountable. So that's why I decided to talk, uh, start a YouTube channel where I talk about different topics uh, relating to business, politics, society. I try to break down different issues to find out, um, you know, what's important, uh, the context, the motives, the incentive structures that are happening in our society. Um, you know, because I think yeah. there's a lot of <laughs> what I would say manufactured outrage that happens in the legacy press that works to divide us. So I'm just trying to add a voice in the opposite direction. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, kind of maybe a lot of what you guys are all about. Totally, yeah, man. it totally aligns yeah. with what we're all about, um, especially that idea of the citizen journalist, because, of course, core to our beliefs here is like the elites have gotten a lot of things wrong and yet they want to keep all the power to themselves. They want to tell the population like you can't possibly understand what's going on out there. Just let us handle it, whether it's the national security state, whether it's the Fed, whether it's any of the people who hold power here in this town. And what you're doing is a sort of direct response to that to say, no. We can delve into these issues, we can understand what's going on, and there's huge stakes for all of us involved, and it's our responsibility to be engaged. So it's very much in line with what we're doing here. Um, full disclosure, the way that we found you was that you made a really lovely video about us <laughs> at Breaking <laughs> Point, and we're like, this is wonderful, like, and my ego guy. feels amazing right now. And yeah. then we watched the rest of your content, and we're right. like, oh, this awesome. guy is really great. Right. And I think it's also fair to say, I mean, this isn't your main job, but you know, you're the type of creator that if you had started at a different time in YouTube's history, when it was more of a free and open marketplace, mm -hmm. You're, you would have you know grown phenomenally because the content you create is so high quality, it's so well researched, it's well edited, it's well produced, it's well put together, you do a great job presenting the information, and yet YouTube is no longer a free and open marketplace. So we're hoping that you know for you, that it helps give a boost to, to your channel and what you're doing there, because more people need eyeballs on, you know, you've got contents of, uh, content here, is Web3 really a giant stuff. lie? Yeah. Is the media tricking you into hating Joe Rogan? Um, Starbucks, the fight is just mm -hmm. beginning. So really great and important content. Hopefully we can give a lift to you, and I know our audience is gonna love what you have in store for us. So um, with that being said, you have put together your first offering for our audience. Just talk to us about your inspiration and what they're about to see. Yeah, um, well, thanks for all those uh, really kind, uh, really kind words. But yeah, so today's piece, you know, I think to, to set it up a, a little bit, you know, we've all seen corporations and how, you know, I think a lot of the behavior that they've been uh, kind of, uh, I, I would say, uh, Sorry, how is it? It's okay. Um, just come come out of the just top. Start, yeah, just, just restart start your again. answer. Okay, restart the answer. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I knew that was gonna happen at some point. Okay. It's um, all right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for all the kind words there. Um, so today's piece uh, that I have for you guys is about um, you know, to set it up a little bit of the context is I would deem corporations, a lot of their behavior is being evil, greedy, uh, I'd say maybe anti humanity. And I just wanted to delve into more of why that's happening and uh, something that um, you know I wanted to look into was the MBA program, which uh, a lot of uh, Fortune 500, S&P 500 CEOs have, and I think that deserves a closer examination. What are they being taught? I myself went through that program, so I wanted to share with you guys a little bit of uh, the behind the scenes of maybe why corporations are potentially becoming more evil based on the education that these executives are receiving. I love it. So I love is, that. Yep. James, very excited to have you on board. Um, can't wait to watch this video. Um, are, is the MBA program training our corporate elites to be sociopaths? Yes. Let's take a look. <laughs> My name is James Lee. Welcome to 5149. And today I want to talk about the MBA program and why it's contributing to corporations becoming more evil. We've all seen or read the recent headlines. Business is booming. Corporate profits are at an all-time high. But at the very same time, 
workers who make those businesses run are being left behind, some even homeless, on food stamps, or working multiple jobs. Also, recent upticks in high-profile worker unionization efforts have corporations like Amazon scrambling to pay big bucks for, quote, union avoidance. A recent analysis estimated that private sector employers spend nearly $340 million per year hiring union avoidance advisors to help them prevent employees from organizing in the workplace. Mm, cricket stuff to say the least. But interestingly, it hasn't always been this way. In 1951, General Motors hired McKinsey consultant Arch Patton to conduct a study of executive compensation. The results appeared in Harvard Business Review with the particular finding that from 1939 to 1950, the pay of hourly workers had more than doubled while that of top management had only risen 35%. Hmm. Uh, there are of course many reasons for this shift. We've seen massive consolidation in most major industries since deregulation began in the 1970s which has concentrated power in the hands of just a few mega corporations. Uh, also, our lawmakers are in the pockets of big business special interests, uh, as corporations and other wealthy donors can influence public policy by contributing more or less unlimited sums into political campaigns via things like super PACs and other dark money organizations with even less transparency. Uh, we've also seen the working class gutted by a bipartisan neoliberal consensus towards globalization and union busting, which uh, subsequently has brought union membership to all-time lows and has also crippled domestic production. But in the end, if we break it down, corporations are just people, people making choices and decisions. And those choices and decisions that they make could end up shaping the economy and are heavily influenced by factors such as education, training, and incentives. And that's what I wanna focus on here today. According to Fortune Magazine, about 40% of S&P 500 CEOs have an MBA in any given year. And just a bit of background, the MBA is what's known as a Master's in Business Administration and is the most common and prestigious advanced degree for those looking to get ahead in corporate America. Uh, many elite universities have one of these programs with tuitions costing students tens of thousands of dollars annually with the hope that this investment will pay off in the form of a wide professional network and a good paying job. The MBA is basically a prerequisite to C-suite offices at this point, uh, as it is by far the degree with the most representation among top business executives, and I'm one of these people. Not a corporate executive, of course, but I am a graduate of New York University's Stern School of Business MBA program. So what are people like me, the quote, future business leaders of America, who could end up shaping uh, the economy as well as the fortunes of millions of Americans, what are we being taught? Well, to start, everything that is taught in any top tier MBA program today is more or less filtered through the lens of an ethos that is summed up quite well by this 1970 headline uh, of this New York Times Magazine article written by the famed American libertarian economist and statistician Milton Friedman, and that headline is entitled, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. It's every keen, aspiring business executive's guiding light. Uh, of course, yes, our curriculum does consist of core courses like finance, accounting, marketing, and business strategy, along with other elective courses that focus on different industries like entertainment, media, fintech, private equity, and many others. But every subject, every case study seems to always boil down to this fundamental principle, this idea that management's sole duty is to maximize shareholder value with zero, or at the very least, minimal regard for workers, communities, country, environment, or anything else for that matter. But once again, it wasn't always this way as history can show us. Harvard Business School, the first graduate business program, was founded in 1908 with the mission to treat business as a science create a management profession on par or superior to medicine and law, and handle business problems in a socially constructive way. The first dean of HBS, Wallace B. Donham, defined it as, quote, the development, strengthening, and multiplication of socially-minded businessmen as the central problem of business. Mm, kind of a far cry from where we are today and the, quote, business leaders being churned out by elite MBA programs. So how exactly did advanced business education go off the rails, so to speak? Well, looking at this graph depicting the Dow Jones Industrial Average through the decades, U.S. businesses suffered through a long period of economic stagnation during the 1970s and early 80s, 
And this brought about sort of a thorough critique of American management, including American business education, a very kind of dramatic shift in narrative. I want to read to you a little bit from an article entitled How Neoclassical Economics Corrupted Business Schools, Corporations, and the Economy by Herbert Gintis and Rakesh Kurana, two prominent business scholars. Quote, using the poor corporate performance of the 1970s as their backdrop, these takeover artists successfully recast the image of corporate managers and executives not as wise corporate statesmen trying to adjudicate the competing concerns of a variety of corporate constituents, but rather as a self-dealing, unaccountable elite whose primary interest was taking advantage of weak shareholders to promote a leisurely lifestyle and exaggerated material gain. <laughs> I think it's a little bit funny, this image of a weak and impotent shareholder class. Uh, it does kind of show you how powerful a narrative can be if effectively sold to the public, particularly by elites who would happen to benefit greatly from the implementation of such an ideology. Oh golly, the abuses us shareholders take from managers and workers. What a travesty. <laughs> Back to Gintis and Corona. Quote, the revisionism surrounding materialism that took place during the 1980s had a profound impact on business education. It represented an institutional shift away from the basic managerialism framework that had defined and informed business education and animated the managerial professionalization project from its start, eventually replacing it with a new conception that is never fully specified, but whose broad outlines can be understood as a conception of management as an agent of shareholders, the corporation as a nexus of individual contracts, and the primary purpose of the corporation being to maximize shareholder value. All right, you might be thinking, what's wrong with that? You know, we are running a business after all, and I don't necessarily disagree. Um, it is important that a business make money so that it can pay its employees, make good products, invest in new things, new products, give back to the community, and make sure that shareholders are happy so they're gonna invest more money in the future. But if we're talking about a holistic, socially responsible business education that teaches future leaders to consider other goals besides profit maximization, this is not it whatsoever. Now, the next thing I'll share with you is purely anecdotal, but my business strategy professor at NYU and a lecturer I remember really well um, brought up this example of Shake Shack and how the tables in their new restaurants were sourced from recycled wood. Uh, and she talked about how stupid the whole thing was because she felt that furnishing their restaurants with recycled wood would not help them sell more burgers and fries and that, you know, with each new store they were opening, uh, they were lowering their return on invested capital, a financial metric that Wall Street investors happen to care a lot about. She's not necessarily wrong in that regard. Buying recycled tables probably won't help Shake Shack sell more burgers and fries and will most certainly be more expensive than a normal non-recycle table, but it is most certainly better for the environment, and especially considering Shake Shack has opened hundreds of new locations and stores in just the past few years, they seem to be doing just fine as is. In another course at NYU called Managing Growing Companies, a course that, quote, seeks to provide an understanding of the knowledge and skills that are required to manage and grow small to mid-sized firms, we actually had an entire lecture dedicated to union busting, various tactics, management, can and should take to end a labor strike. A uh, particular example I remember specifically is something to the effect of training your white collar workers to perform blue collar tasks. And, and folks, uh, we just saw how this strategy was just used by John Deere in real time when workers were striking for better wages. Uh, the white collar workers ended up being a total disaster. A few of them were even sent to the hospital. So right there, even in an academic setting, a wedge is already being driven between management and labor, creating this kind of us versus them mentality at a very early stage in the careers of people who aspire to be business managers and executives. And this has real world life and death implications for management and workers, uh, but also for consumers. I'll give you an example, referencing uh, an article from The Atlantic entitled The Long Forgotten Flight that sent Boeing off course. A company once driven by engineers became driven by finance. Essentially two decades ago, Boeing made a, a, a deliberate attempt to isolate the company's engineers from its executive team by moving the company's headquarters uh, to Chicago, which is over 1,700 miles away from its primary manufacturing facility in Washington. 
And just like what we're trained to do in business school, which is to pour over Excel spreadsheets and make fancy PowerPoints, over the years, um, Boeing executives started making engineering decisions by way of financial spreadsheets in a vacuum completely separate from the company's manufacturing operations. In the case of their 787 plane, Boeing didn't outsource just the manufacturing of the parts. It turned over the design, the engineering, and the manufacture of entire sections of the plane to some 50 strategic partners. Boeing itself ended up building less than 40% of the plane. This strategy was trumpeted as a reinvention of manufacturing, but while the finance guys loved it, since it meant that Boeing had to put up less money, it was a huge headache for engineers. As a result, to this day, the plane has continued to suffer from numerous safety and manufacturing quality issues, all in an effort to make an extra buck with you know, kind of very little consideration for anything else. The most famous example and one with the most dire of consequences is probably the 737 MAX plane with hundreds of deaths resulting from a safety system being vetoed, according to a Boeing engineer. This is New York Times reporting, quote, a senior Boeing engineer filed an internal ethics complaint this year saying that during the development of the 737 MAX jet, the company had rejected a safety system to minimize costs, equipment he felt could have reduced risks that contributed to two fatal crashes. So right, there are real world societal life and death implications resulting from the type of business trading and the, you know, in my opinion, unhealthy shareholder maximizing ethos that is so pervasive in the curriculum of top tier MBA programs and thus also permeating offices and boardrooms of America's top companies. And unfortunately, you know, there is little to no penalty for this type of behavior, right? Let's remember that the US government routinely gives companies like Boeing billion dollar government contracts as part of our defense budget, no matter how unsafe or unethical uh, their practices might be. Duff McDonnell, who wrote the book, The Golden Passport, Harvard Business School, The Limits of Capitalism and the Moral Failure of the MBA Elite, asserts that, quote, the school is a force for good in the sense that HBS grads are good at what they do, but they really do good. Rather than producing business physicians who vow to do no harm, Harvard Business School has become the West Point of capitalism, producing business mercenaries driven by self-interest, beholden to no one, believing in nothing. Yeah, it's pretty scathing, uh, and to be fair, MBA programs have responded to this type of widespread criticism by adding a sort of business ethics course to the curriculum. I myself took one at NYU, um, actually with Professor Jonathan Haidt. Some of you probably have heard of him. He's a fairly well-known social psychologist whose works includes um, The Coddling of the American Mind and also The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And his course, you know, quite honestly, was super cool, uh, very interesting discussions, but it was also extremely brief, lasting, you know, just a few sessions over the course of two weekends, which does kind of show the priorities of the curriculum, right? It, it, like I said, I found the discussion to be really interesting, but unfortunately, the course design itself felt more like, I think, compliance, uh, maybe even call it theater more than anything else. But just to give the other side, you know, if, if you're watching this and you recently got your MBA, you might totally disagree with everything I'm saying. Uh, you know, like, no, my education was holistic. We learned about ideas like stakeholder capitalism, which is something that's currently being promulgated by the Business Roundtable. And to that I say, yes, we, we definitely did talk about those types of things. Specifically at NYU, there was this phrase that was thrown around a lot um, that we are in quote, the business of doing good. So I think the intent might be there, but unfortunately the incentive structure can't possibly support this in practice. NYU, for example, talks a big game when marketing its MBA programs with inspirational slogans like change, innovation, an MBA without boundaries. But if you take a look at the program's most recent employment report, more than two thirds of the graduating class are recruited into traditional industries like consulting and financial services, you know, definitely, you know, this is once again my opinion, but not at the top of my list of professions in the business of doing good or changing the world. This is just my personal experience, but uh, I went in, I think, with an open mind, quite an idealistic goal that I could work in maybe news media with the goal of changing public discourse for the better. But within two weeks, I was told pretty much, you know, you can either work in consulting, banking, or for Amazon. <laughs> that is it. There are, of course, exceptional people who are able to carve their own path, but I was not one of them. 
maybe until now. And like anything else, the recruiting funnel is designed to respond to incentives. Uh, for example, placement success contributes 35% to each school's overall rank in the US News and World Report ranking methodology, which is kind of seen as the gold standard for MBA rankings. So of course the school's administrators are gonna push you towards jobs that uphold the um, nothing is gonna fundamentally change ethos that seems to pervade our modern day business and political culture. And just to be fair to the students, if you strap them with hundreds of thousand dollars of debt, uh, they're not gonna be able to take the kinds of risks that are being advertised by top tier MBA programs with this idea of change and entrepreneurship. So I guess what I'm pointing out is uh, that there's this huge disconnect between what is being marketed and what actually transpires in reality because, you know, the incentive structures uh, are so poorly designed that anything other than propping up the currently um, unhealthy and unsustainable status quo can't possibly exist, even in an academic setting, let alone real world business situations that will impact the lives of millions of people. This is a little bit of a joke, but it's really not. But it's like business schools are training students to think of everything in terms of return on capital. And if you can maximize returns without screwing over people, ignoring morals and destroying the environment, you should. But if you can't, uh, it's also okay to screw over people, ignore morals and destroy the environment for the sake of even the slightest increase in profits. So in a world where CEOs and executives make millions even as their companies file for bankruptcy, I maybe naively think that it might behoove us to think about whether the system and the values we teach today uh, will help create a world we wanna live in tomorrow. Um, today's MBA programs work a lot like factories churning out middle to upper management professionals and managers who are becoming increasingly uh, more diverse in the way they look but unfortunately not in the way they think, right? I think it's kind of ironic that business schools often talk a lot about the importance of relationships, things like innovation, social responsibility, but at the same time are still very intolerant of ideas that deviate from traditional business orthodoxy and pretty much train their students to function like Excel spreadsheets. More numbers and screens and less humanity and empathy. And that, my friend, is how the NBA has contributed to corporations becoming more evil. Uh, if you like this segment and would like to see more of me uh, and other collaborations like this, please let Crystal and Sagar know. And of course, subscribe to Breaking Points. Uh, if you're inclined, also check out my channel, 5149 with James Lee, where I release weekly videos about business, politics, and society. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.